Okay, just to explain. Um, well, one thing I noticed with Bob Phillips, um, is he still here, Bob? Um, I'm here, Joe. Okay, I'm well, I have to say, <laughs> I think it was always raining in your photographs. I, I'm deeply worried, you know, there's a cloud of rain following you around. Uh, or maybe you're following the cloud of rain, uh, because you're projecting an image of Manchester, which is, yeah, really wet, I have to say. Uh, and I, 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 I fundamentally, you know, question that. So part of my objective here is to say, okay, how can we bring sunshine back to this benighted city, uh, which is so proud of itself, but so wet. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and it's going to get wetter, obviously, in the future, climate change and all that. So on that note, uh, I will uh, do a, a, a totally unashamed commercial plug. Uh, there's a book here called Rethinking Master Planning, organised by Hussam al from Dundee, uh, who I think is on his way here. Uh, so you can meet him later on. And there's some flyers here. I have a chapter in this book, uh, which is more or less called uh, Master Planning by and for the Urban Shared Mind Towards a Neighbourhood 3.0. All sounds very grand. Uh, and on the cover of the book, as you can see, you've got this rather bijou-looking urban square, all very urbanist and civilised and so on. And if you're like me, at the back of your mind, there are these questions that keep popping up. So, oh, I'm not sure about this. Uh, look, look at these workers, young workers on zero hours. Uh, the homeless obviously are not in this picture. They have been moved on before the phot photographers arrived. Uh, urban kids, well, they must be at private school because there aren't any public schools in the city centre. Uh, the boutique market, all very nice, but it's clearly displaced all the local traders that used to sell, you know, hot, um, tripe and things that you could buy in Coronation Street. Um, jelly deals, whatever. Uh, the warehouse conversions are, in fact, you know, replica well, warehouse conversions. And this whole business of affluent urbanism is serviced by out-of-town big-box uh, mouths. Um, and one could go on and on, you know, the token street tree is very nice, but they're not going to do anything serious for real climate change. We have to ask, what is this master planning thing anyway? And as uh, David Rudlin commented and when he reviewed this book on master planning, seriously, you're calling it master planning in this 21st century? We have to think of a better title than that, top-down, patriarchal, <coughs> sexist, and, and so on. So this is all part of a critical agenda, which for myself I'm trying to make sense of. It's easy to stand in a corner and criticise. It's much more interesting, I think, to find, OK, so what is the way forward? What are the solutions? If, what are the opportunities? So oh, and here's a bit of a cartoon from the Futures series. Uh, our well-heeled friends have just come out of the Opera House and they nearly trip over a man who lives in a cardboard box. This happens not far from here. Uh, you can see for yourself on your urban tour. I hope you get some homeless experience in there. Um, you can borrow an old parka jacket, you know, for the day if you want, um, and so on. So um, where is all this leading to? What are these opportunities? Well, a long time ago I read Jane Jacobs and Mumford and, you know, these gurus of the urban field, uh, and this sets some things going in my mind, and I think many other minds. So here's a picture of a mind, and what was really coming up is that most urban problems are really rather complex, they're interconnected. And what do we have? Policy. Well, most policy is very simple and not well connected. It tends to be in boxes and silos, as we all know. Design is one thing which can bring all these together, but design, let's be honest, is usually paid for by money, uh, and therefore we all, myself included, tended to dance to that tune. Uh, business and technology and so on, it's a very powerful force, it's very technically smart. But other values, social, ecological, etc., are equally important, maybe. How do we work with these more integrated social and economic systems? Ecological, cultural, whatever. Uh, so this began to crystallise in my mind and many others, as a, an agenda, which is to say, well, cities, if they're any good, they should bring all these together. It's not all about money. What we see as we walk down the road is, you know, very often the forces of money and the forces of technical excellence and high-rise and 
globalised uh, supply chains, and so on. So this is then a challenge for urban design and planning, how to move from smart to wise. Now, this is the framing that I've used myself. There are many others. I'd like to just run past you three, uh, two projects, uh, which illustrate work in progress. Well, firstly, there's uh, some general observations which show up in the chapter in the book, Commercial Plug. Um, and first we look at you know, different models of neighbourhoods. And obviously there's a lot of overlap between the concept of neighbourhood and the concept of urban design. And here we see, yes, uh, monofunctional land uses. Uh, sorry, the writing has gone weird, but it says the school is like a prison uh, surrounded by a big wall and a security fence. Um, children and youth are unwelcome, unsafe, very difficult to cross the road. Supermarkets have super parking. Uh, and uh, all in all, it works in functional terms. It can even be good for economic development. But would you want to live there if you had the choice? And then, of course, on the other side, we've got you know the happy, healthy, diverse, mixed-use, vibrant neighbourhood of Jacobs and many, many others, uh, to which we all kind of aspire. The Manchester Design Guide mentioned is one thing which aspired towards this. But in my view, and many others, it kind of stops short. It says, well, build your buildings like this and have a plot ratio like that and a street section uh, profile like this. Everything should be OK. Or, you know, everything should be fine. You know, we'll be like Barcelona. That was the whole idea behind it. Um, except for the climate, obviously. Uh, and, uh, and yes, but we have to say, OK, so this is not going to be achieved all by design. So that led me and colleagues and so on to look underneath the surface, start analysing land use, the connections between land uses, to start analysing communities and social networks and the connections or lack of between different types of actors. And then we map that back onto the design template and say, well, gosh, what if we did have these multifunctional land uses? How could one thing connect with another thing? What's the logic by which that can be organised? And that's a very important question because usually, on the left-hand side, we have the logic organised by money. What could be simpler? You know, if it's got a price, you trade it, you market it, uh, and it organises itself. Policy and government just do the minimum, and it should be OK. But it's not OK. So then we say, OK, what can be done in urban design and planning terms to enable the people to form networks. Uh, and I think this comes, well, it crosses a lot of boundaries, actually, uh, but it uh, raises questions which are not simply about design, saying, you know, should we have a tree here and a bench there, but rather to say, what could be done in order to foster uh, social cohesion, social interaction, social encounter, conviviality, and so on and so on. So this is kind of an agenda, which then we can start tracking. Uh, it, here it's framed as pathways. I won't talk in detail, it would take another 10 minutes. Uh, but we have economic pathways, we have social pathways, we have ecological pathways, and there could be more. Where is all this leading? Well, work in progress. Here's one project, it's called the Metropolitan Intelligence Lab. One or two people here have worked on it, actually. Um, mini lab for short uh, and this springs from the devolution agenda in Greater Manchester now devolution you might have known might have heard, all very grand you know, sorry, devolve power from Whitehall, jolly good but the subtext is you have to do more with less money uh, uh, particularly in terms of health you know, there's dancing in the streets we got the 6 billion NHS budget we meaning Greater Manchester a year or so ago and then the subtext, oh, actually, we needed over seven million, uh, billion, sorry, and we got six. OK, have to do more with less. So in order to do that, how can we sharpen up the intelligence? Uh, how can we mobilise the knowledge and the so-called co-learning between policy, academics, business, civil society, citizens, whoever they are, and so on? So we have a very small-scale prototype here based on the previous notions of collective intelligence. Uh, we're working on themes of energy retrofits, 
environmental governance. These are just you know, a demonstration to say, yes, this is possible. Uh, we have a social platform, so-called. We have a technical platform. Uh, we map out our priority issues with system maps. We run from one to the other uh, to do our diagnostics. What is the problem? And then, later on in the programme, we look at the prognostics. What could be the solution? Uh, and myself, I run up and down Oxford Road a lot. Um, much nicer now with bike lanes, obviously. Uh, but part of the agenda for the round table, the little dots sitting around a table, is to bring together the policy people, design and professional people, uh, the um, financial community and the academics, assuming that we still know one or two things. Now, um, the practical point is the retrofit agenda. We have approximately half a million houses in very poor condition. And if you look at why are they in poor condition, why can't we just do the right thing and invest the small amount of money, really, uh, get these houses all up to scratch and, you know, level three energy efficiency and so on. Well, we're talking about a very fragmented situation. Uh, on the individual level, we have the house here. It's not coordinated. There are three cars in the drive. All the people are so stressed out. They have to get a long haul flight to Bali just to relax uh, and so on. Uh, not great. Uh, and then what could be the way forward? Well, then we start, and here's some of the you know, blurb that comes out on a very unjoined up situation. If anyone here was involved with the Green Deal, so-called, you'll know how negative and difficult everything was. Uh, so we look on the right-hand side for a joined up situation. Now, this is not at the neighbourhood scale, this is at a city scale, but it's pretty similar in principle. We look for things that join people together, synergies, collaborations. And this is a very simple mapping technique to describe those synergies and collaborations as if the different actors were all sitting around a table. In reality, they don't all sit around the same table at the same time, but this is what we're trying to do. Uh, in the foreground, the picture here is one of the interim outputs, which is mapping in some detail cost of energy, cost of renovation, cost of health uh, services, cost of this and that, in order to then map out uh, the paths, pathways of added value uh, in money saving, energy saving, social benefit, and so on. So that's all going on. The main project, I just wanted to talk very briefly now, uh, is called Learning Loops in the Built Environment, Looper for short. This is just getting going now. Um, it involves the area just the other side of the main road from the university. You see um, uh, top left-hand side, the um, Mancunian Way. Uh, we're just off the bottom of the map on, on our campus. Um, and this area has great aspirations. I think uh, it was mentioned in, in your wet-looking slide there. Um, so here it is on a sunny day. <laughs> uh, that's what I was coming to. And whoop do it's all transformed. You know, new roads, new urbanist spaces, uh, new you know, boulevards even, uh, correcting some of the ghastly mistakes that were made you know, in the 1960s and 70s, and then probably made worse with PFI schemes and so on. So all looks very nice, and in, certainly in the, in the master plan, so to say. And these are some of the housing types. And as you say, well, there's nothing too grand here, you know. No beaten towers, thank you very much. Uh, this is what the people vote for, and this is what they are in the process of getting. And don't forget the people, here they are, some of them. Um, so then we say, well, OK, we've got a whole load of issues. It's mixed. Uh, the ex residents are messed up in all kinds of ways. Society has abused them. I mean, I'm being very crude and blunt. This is what's gone on. Uh, now they're afraid of gentrification, polarisation, migration. The groups are in conflict with each other. There's a complex mix. They think the university is, some of them anyway, you know, it's come to steal their land, their houses and their livelihoods. They don't like us, but we have a project in their patch. What are we going to do? Um, parking is the big issue. I'd like to see Urban Design talk about parking in a really sort of practical, hands-on way. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So it's a situation of conflict, fragmentation. 
Can urban design help? Well, yes, possibly not as we know it. Now, the project is called Looper. I won't go into detail how it works, but you get the idea of the loops where people participate. They put in their information. We talk to them in detail. They then feed that back to the policy people. The policy people, whoever they are, say, OK, uh, yes, would you like it here? And, and the residents say, yes, and so on and so on. Now, in a sense, we've, uh, many of us with longer memories have been working on participation for uh, decades. And we're still here, still working on it. Uh, situations have changed. Well, now we have a bit of theory to introduce. We have learning loops. There's a whole theory of learning. Uh, and if we go for this mode one learning, so okay, how do the students l learn enough facts in order to pass the exam? How do residents learn enough about how policy works to so, say, yes, we want a tree here, thank you, and so on. This is a very sort of direct, functional type of learning. If we then contrast to other types of learning with a wider spectrum, so, well, the residents could learn enough about policy <coughs> to say, yeah, they can be active players. They're not just passive recipients of whatever policy comes up with. Policy people could learn enough about residents to say, yeah, this is not just, you know, providing them with a bunch of stuff. We can actually work with them if they want to do a crash or a training scheme or a food project or whatever. We can help all that stuff to happen. This is, sounds good, it's in many theories, doesn't often happen on the ground. There are, so then we say, okay, couple, the last cartoon. Uh, there's a process model here. And, well, this draws on my own experience living in London, uh, where viable houses and communities were being destroyed to make way for commercial development. Why is this? Because it's a money game. Uh, and here's the boardroom. Uh, resistance and dissent is not allowed and the result in built form tends to be, not always, but it tends to be more monofunctional, less responsive, and so on. Now, I'm talking to an audience of urban designers, so I have to be really careful. You can shoot me down. I hope you will, actually. Um, so but then we say, OK, what's the alternative? Now, in about 1986, we were doing things called Planning for Real, Neighbourhood Forums for Community Development. The, aspiration was for decision making to be inclusive, creative, social return on investment is something that's come up in the meantime. And what we were tending towards was a multifunctional, diverse, self-organized, responsive type of built form. Uh, now, that's a nice idea, not always so simple in practice. So then we say, okay, uh, there are some big issues here, which we're all struggling with, myself, and I'm sure people here are. Um, and uh, is it possible to do good design you know, in response to the <coughs> micro level of community action which is not all top down which is still good design um, given that you know, we're all too busy we have to get in there and get out with the fees uh, and some credit and, and so on um, a bigger question which the looper thing demonstrates how far can design help social and economic problems in an environment which is actually quite hostile? It's all messed up. Uh, gentrification, migration, unemployment, uh, abuse by the welfare system, and so on. All these problems pile one on top of the other. It's relatively easy to come in as a designer and say, oh, yeah, well, let's do a master plan and you know, get some money in, and, and that should be OK. We know it's not OK. Uh, so these questions crop up I'm going to just leave you here and maybe we can talk over coffee um, and as you can see these questions multiply up in all directions so uh, oh, final commercial plug uh, book coming out been too many years writing builds on the first book on the left and you're all very welcome to a discount I'll let you know in due course thank you very much <coughs>